Hi, I'm Maureen O'Brien. This is the Sirens of Audio. What's not to enjoy? Good. Dr. Back. First of all, I just wanted to say I'm really jealous. Yeah, I think I have a lot of sympathy with people who think that John Pertwee is the best Doctor Who. You're allowed to be an old man now. Exactly. I wept like a baby. I've just been crying in the shower because of you. Typical Nick Briggs just going mad. He's never had a crush on me. Let's challenge challenge. That could be a new segment in your podcast. It is that we have gone on a several tangents. We're in a war. It's, it's, <laughs> we're going on different ta tangents all over the place. If there was one person you expected not to want to do a multi-doctor story, it would be Tom Baker. Yeah, maybe I did dress up as Santa Claus and put a funny hat on and stuff, but I don't know. Oh yeah, in episode nine of that story, the daughter of the script editor was in fact the husband's wife of the man who, you know, snot. It's just snot. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip. It's a special episode today because this is the day that the 60th anniversary episode is going out. And joining us on this day is the, the man from whom I stole the title of this podcast. It's Nicholas Briggs. G'day Nick. Hello, hello. Good day, I mean, sorry. <laughs> it's, 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 hello's fine, Nick. Welcome. You can't say good day. You can't say good day with an English accent, can you? No, it's you don't. Patronizing. Don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> it's cultural appropriation. That's what it is. <laughs> Welcome. How are things uh, over where you are? You're not in your usual location at the moment. No, I'm in London at the moment because I uh, I came here for a uh, screening of uh, an episode that will have aired today. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and you you had some nice things to say about it uh, before we came on. Are they still the same now that we're officially recording? Well, they're even nicer now we're officially recording. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, marvelous. Excellent. Well, I'm sure Excellent. I've, well, I'm sure I've enjoyed as well. I think it's fantastic. What's well, not to enjoy? Good. Doctor Who's back. Doctor Who's back. David Tennant's back. Excellent. Donna's back. Oh, look at yeah! I can't wait. It's been away for a long time, hasn't it? Multiple it has months, been when you it? think about it. Yeah, yeah. When was Thank the last episode? Started. When was when was Jodie's? Uh, was it finale? October? October last year? Was it, it? Yeah, it was just just over twelve months ago. Well, by the time when this is airing, it will be thirteen months ago. For the BBC, like the BBC maths. centenary, it was one hundred. <laughs> But we uh, uh, not only is it the 60th today, but we are here today to talk about a story that uh, you produced, Nick, for the 50th anniversary called The Light at the End. And mm. we want to talk to you a little bit about that in depth. But before we do that, Philip, do you know what? No, what, Dwayne? We're going to do it all together. We're going to jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us down the rabbit hole. Philip, do you think I could go first this time with uh, with my question? I usually ask you and put you on the spot. But yeah, no, of course you can my, go first. My question is, since it's the anniversary season of Doctor Who, and it's a, the, the decade ones are always big, the 40th, 50th, 60th, etc. The 70th is going to be huge. I can see it now. Um, a lot of us fans tend to go to our comfort episodes of, of Doctor Who. So... My question to you both will be, what's your comfort Doctor Who episode? And I, I was inspired by you, Nick, because I listened to the extras for Audacity um, when I listened to that yesterday, and you mentioned an episode that you really have affection for. Um, but I want to talk just uh, briefly about mine, and that would be, I, I find it interesting that at this time I've, I've gone to a third Doctor adventure, season seven. And it's Doctor Who and the Silurians. That's one that's a, a comfort episode for me for many, many reasons. But one of the 
things that I keep remembering when I when I go back to this episode is that this was probably the first episode I recorded on cassette off the TV. Uh, wow. I had two episodes of it, episode five, episode seven. So I listened to those two episodes. I can still repeat them back verbatim. Um, but it was at a time when my parents were building a house. So dad would go to work. My parents would go out after us kids came home from school and I would look after my younger brother and sister, Doctor Who would come on. And it was the mid mid eighties. Um, the third and fourth doctors were being repeated all the time on, on Australian television. And it was the third doctor. There's something totally unique about the third doctor and something that the, dare I say, I'm speaking as an old man. Now the, the, the younger generation seems to find the third doctor at times a little bit abrasive, a little bit rude. They do, don't, they, don't they? They don't seem to be able to cope with him. But for me, I found John Pertwee, the third doctor, to be a very safe person to be with. Um, he was he was the crazy uncle that you wanted to hang out with, but you always knew you were safe. And that's the feeling I always had with the third doctor. And particularly season seven, some, some people say that's where he's most abrasive. Um, but I, I just don't get that. And so Doctor Who and the Silurians is my comfort episode, not to mention Kerry Blyton's music. It just suits that episode perfectly. <laughs> yep. Do you guys it. have any thoughts on that episode? Well, I named it, <clears throat> you will, I think you'll now know that I, <clears throat> the Radio Times newsletter, uh, email newsletter in this uh, country, well, available on the internet. So anyone anyway, can look at it. <laughs> Um, asked a load of Doctor Who people to sort of take over the newsletter for one edition. And, you know, I've, Sophie's done it and a lo load of other people, and they asked me to do it. And they ask you to name your top uh, three Doctor Who episodes. And uh, after saying, it's impossible because it changes daily for me. But uh, Doctor Who and the Silurians is one of them. So I'm, I'm completely on your side with that. Uh, it is weird, isn't it? How I, yeah, working with younger people, they say, "Oh, you know, of course, the third Doctor, he's very patronising and authoritarian, isn't he?" I thought, "What?" I never got that. <laughs> I, I never got it. I thought he's just really, yeah, just like you say, safe, a safe, mm -hmm. kind man. But I suppose you look at it through modern eyes, and he has that slight air of authority about him. He just took but no I nonsense like when he from anybody. He against authority as he well. Talks, you know, he, he was, no. talks down Shin and Axos. He talks down, or everyone who comes with authority, he talks them down and abuses them and, and puts puts them down. So he's not, yeah. he's not an authority figure. He's, he's the, the opposite. It's, it's not so much abuse as just not taking nonsense and, you know, not being walked <laughs> over by oh, someone. He's pretty awful by just a chin. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Chin is a... It. Jim's an imbecile, isn't yes. it? <laughs> a self-serving imbecile. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's mine, Philip. What about yours? Um, mine is probably Robots of Death. Oh, I think. Um, so when I when I started watching the show, I think it was it was during the constant repeats of Tom Baker and John Pertwee, um, which we got out here, and I kicked off about the androids invasion, but the Robots of Death and the strangling of Pamela Salem, Toos, is a scene that really emotionally affected me. I think I think I'd already had a crush on Toos by that stage, yes. and um, I still do with Pamela Salem. Just she just has to talk, and I'm off. Um, and that scene where she's yeah, Tom Baker about, used to say, Tom Baker used to say about Pamela Salem, he said she's so beautiful. When she came on stage, men would weep. Yes, well, I can relate <laughs> to that. And when I thought she was dead, it was the strongest emotional reaction I think I'd ever had to a TV show. Because it takes wow. you a while to work out that she's not actually dead. Um, and then she survived when it, no one had hardly anyone that had so did. Um, and Louise Jamison's performance is amazing, the sets and everything. And so I remember that going through and then repeating back and then coming back to it again. And every time it came back, I just, that show just grew and grew. And it's just, if I have to pull out a DVD and watch something, that's the one I pull out and throw in. I think it's just the perfect Doctor Who, the plotting the acting, the architecture, this, the costuming, the makeup, everything just gels to make this amazing piece of work. Even the silly headdresses make sense. <laughs> it's, it, interestingly, when I started recording Doctor Who off-air with my old beta cassette recorder, Robots of Death was number one in my collection. So that was the first episode I ever recorded. It's prob so it's probably the one I've seen more times than any other. And um, yeah, it was it was fascinating to talk with Brian Croucher a few episodes ago 
about his recollections of that. If you go back to that episode, he's got an interesting story, not so much about the production, but one of his guest cast members. Um, go back and listen to that. It's quite amusing. He had a happy time. Uh, making I can it. imagine. I can imagine with Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about you, Nick? What's yeah. your comfort Doctor Who? Uh, well, I'm, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm really jealous, although it was 10 years or so later, that you had an audio recording of the Silurians. You know, if I I would have loved to have had an audio recording of it, you know, when I first saw it. It's, I had to wait until uh, uh, Frontier in Space before I'd actually thought of doing audio recordings. And as I might have told you guys before, I only recorded it to get the theme tune. I eventually realised I could just buy the record, and it was, in fact, the first record I ever bought, the Doctor Who theme, of course, uh, but in 1973. So, and I accidentally would start, because I was so concerned about missing the beginning of the end theme tune, I'd start recording before the end of the episode, and then I realised... I was listening to those little fragments of episodes more and I recorded more and more as the story went on. I thought, right. And I kicked myself for not recording Planet of the Daleks. But I thought the next time the Daleks are back, I'm going to record them, which is why I'm so obsessed with Death to the Daleks, because it was the first story. I didn't record it in its entirety because I didn't have enough tape. But I thought the Daleks won't be in episode one anyway. I'll record it from episode two onwards. I was pretty much right about that. Um, So... uh, a comfort episode, gosh, it's a, they're all such a comfort to me, particularly the 70s ones. Uh, Death to the Daleks, obviously. Uh, as you may have heard Benji and I going on about on the Big Finish podcast, we're watching John Pertwee in black and white because that's how I first saw it and I have this theory. Stephen Noonan, I think, might have introduced the theory to me that um, he's our first doctor in case you don't know. I know you guys know. Um that a lot of the directors working on Doctor Who back then were trained in black and white. And even though, of course, they were fully aware they were working in colour, it's they were still thinking of it in terms of those sort of stark contrasts of, of gradations of shading. And if you watch the episodes in black and white, they visually just work a lot better. I think it takes, until we get to maybe the final um John Pertwee season where actually it probably starts to work better in colour. Although actually Death of the Daleks works well in black and white. Anyway, um, it's really, I want to say Evil of the Daleks, but I can't watch it. But, you know, I just would love to see Evil of the Daleks again. I saw it twice and I want to see it at least three times before I die. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Um, perhaps it will flash before my eyes as I'm dying. I'll just <laughs> grab hold of that to, but um, can we cast? So, 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 some of us have seen Evil the Daleks before we were able to. So, is it yeah. as good? Is your memory of it as good as everyone? Is yeah, it and also you see that surviving episode cements it actually because it's so tightly directed, isn't it? It's such yeah. a lovely piece of work with that really good incidental music. That's perfect, I think. And it's um, and I think that even though I think the plot plot probably meanders a bit when they're running around in Scaro and and all that, but yeah, I I. I loved it so much. I was so delighted when it was repeated. I think it took me like an episode to realise I'd seen it before because I was very young at the time. I thought, hold on a sec, that's that one. Oh, great. You know, I was really excited about that. But I was going to say with season seven, basically, I said to a mate the other night on the phone, a fellow Doctor Who fan, I said, if I start watching Spearhead from Space, I... I'm sunk. I have to watch that whole season. I can't. I can't stop at the end of it. I have to do the whole lot, and I. I love it because it's because it's the John Pertwee era, but not the John Pertwee era. It's before they kind of worked out exactly what they were doing, and it's sort of it feels fascinating because it's unique. And you're right. I think I think John Pertwee is le- less comfy in that, you know. But I don't think he puts a foot wrong. I think it's a brilliant performance. He's yeah, I was talking to Katie. I was so proud to chat to Katie Manning about it and tell her the truth that I was always a bit dodgy about John Pertwee because when he left he said he hated the Daleks and I was upset about that. So I I went, well, that's the end of you, John Pertwee. And then I met him and he was a very intimidating man and it upset me quite a lot. But I've gone back to it. I think it's the career of his it's the performance of his career. I nearly got the words around the wrong way. Um you know, it, he he. It's a brilliant piece of work. Yeah, I think I have a lot of sympathy with people who think that John Pertwee is the best Doctor Who. You know, my, my favourite Doctor always has to be Patrick Troughton, but you know, it is a storming piece of work. I think. 
Have you given the animations a try? Because, of course, you can watch Evil of the Daleks in animation. Do you find that? I certainly bought the Blu-ray or the DVD or whatever it was, a disc thing that I put in a machine. Um, yes, I mean, I've, I, um, I think it's great that the animations exist. Um, I worry about them overwriting my actual memories. So I think I'd prefer, personally, I, no disrespect to the people who put tons of effort into the, the animations. Um, but personally, I'd rather watch um, the photo reconstructions. Difficult sometimes where there are no telly snaps. Um, and some of those to watch uh, are hilarious when they're just constantly using little cutout bits of other photos. But I don't know. It's um, The problem with the uh, animations is that to make animation really, really good, you have to have lots of money. And they clearly have very, very low budgets. And there's a lot of people working on them for nowhere near as much money as they should be paid. There are a lot of really, really talented, great people working on them, and but they can't achieve what they want to achieve. And so they've adopted sort of stylized choices and some of those. Are, uh, and I'm not very keen on the way they've altered some of the episodes. I don't quite see the point of that. Um, but, you know, that's just my point so of view. I'm 63. What can you say? You know? You're allowed to be an old man now. Exactly. <laughs> so so you would have been excited with the return of, is it 10 years ago now that Enemy of the World and the yeah. of Fear were returned? So did were those I wept. still in your I memory? Wept. I, I wept. I wept yeah. like a baby. You know, I bought, uh, did I not tell you the story that uh, last time I was on that um, it was being, they were being released on iTunes as it was then. Yeah. And I was in America, uh, some big convention, and I was in the terrible little hotel room. And uh, I was woken up by a text from uh, my friend James George, who didn't know I was in America. So he thought he was texting me during the day, but he was actually texting me in the middle of the night. So I was woken up. I, I, didn't, I hadn't worked out how to turn off my notifications back then. So I thought, oh, God, I've only just got to sleep. Who's that? And he said, are we excited about Web of Fear and Enemy of the World on iTunes? And I thought, we are excited. And I bought them immediately and downloaded them. And I thought, I'll just watch a little bit. I just watched the whole lot. Didn't get any sleep. So I was a bit emotionally overawed. And then I got in the shower. I thought, oh, it's time to get up now. And as the water was pouring on me, I just burst into tears joy and just because it was like a, as I think I said at the time it was like a, a a dead relation who you loved dearly knocking on the door go hi I'm still alive by the way and you just go oh my god I texted um, Fraser Hines and told him I said I've just been crying in the shower because of you <laughs> I don't know how he took that <laughs> Typical Nick Briggs just going mad, yeah. You know? But yeah, it was a hugely emotional experience. I'm getting quite teary talking about it now. Hugely emotional, yeah. What amazed me about particularly the Enemy of the World was I'd heard mm. it a couple of times on audio with uh, with the narration. I knew basically what the what the story was, but I could not believe how much it went up in my estimation when I actually saw the 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 product as it was originally intended. It was an incredible yes, piece I of work. I hadn't heard the audio. I just remembered it from being a kid as one that bored me. Because, yeah. you know, it's not for kids. Didn't have monsters it, really? in it. Exactly. I just thought, and when I'd heard about it after, I thought, oh, God, that, that was that one. I I probably missed some of the episodes because I found it so dull. You know, Doctor Who's a bit rubbish at the moment, I, I was thinking, I imagine. Um, but, yeah, a total revelation to see it again. And, and it's just so glorious, isn't it? So, so many great performances. I, I do remember having, a, I must have watched quite a lot of it, actually. I remember I had a real crush on Astrid, you know. Yeah. Mary Peach. Mary Peach. Yeah. Yeah. I think Fraser Hines did too. I think Fraser Hines <laughs> had a crush on everybody he worked with. <laughs> He's never had a crush on me. Well, true. Well, I mean, not that I know of. And of course, I mentioned before that that you made mention of Revenge of the Cybermen in the extras to the latest Big Finish release, Audacity. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a connection there with Doctor Who and the Silurians with the with the incidental music, Kerry Blyton. 
it's a very 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 interesting uh choice of choice of music i don't know if it works quite in the same way as it did with the silurians and death to the daleks by the way yes i don't know what his um criteria were for uh the music in revenge of the cybermen um all that sort of deep sort of horn stuff and that piccolo uh, trumpet um you know and i tried when we did doctor who uh, that was return of the um cybermen when we did a, a lost stories version of it on big finish you know i was delighted to do the music and um and i did it in that carrie blyton style but you're crossing it over with sort of orion stuff as well weren't you well that's certainly the same uh melodies yes that i'd created for the cybermen yeah yeah but the yeah. the for want of a, a less highfalutin word, the orchestration of it, the arrangement of it was very much, and the, the instruments were was very much not only Carrie Blyton's score for Revenge of the Cybermen, but also uh, the additions by Peter Howell and the Radiophonic Workshop. I used some of those electronic sa- sounds as well. I had too much fun doing it. I think there's slightly too much music in it. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I think I should have just left it quiet, but I just couldn't stop myself, you know. Well, yeah, it's marvellous. I love it. I love it. I find it, I find it easier to do that kind of music than the Dudley Simpson style stuff I tried to do for the third Doctor. Um, yeah. it's. Uh, I think it's because there's a more uh, primitive, stripped back quality to Carrie Blyton's music. Um, uh, so, you know, if you're more of a primitive, stripped back musician, um, you uh, you find that easier to do. You know, he will often just use a, a solo instrument doing something and nothing else with it. So, uh, it's quite so I stark. love your score, uh, intelligence, intelligence for War. You did the score for that, didn't you? That was oh yes, yeah. That, that's yeah I do all the Doctor ones now. That, that's a great score. So oh, yes, I was listening to that recently, about a week ago. I was the music. I was getting distracted by the music because I was enjoying the music so much. It was putting me back in the period, and I had to go back. Oh, better listen to that again because I've missed the dialogue because I was off with the music. So, oh, that's, well, that's, that's nice. That's Thank you. Uh, I think that's a compliment. It is. I'm always. Compliment. It's it's always a challenge to do that cheerful music that Dudley Simpson quite often did when the when the the TARDIS. I was going to say when Bessie whooshes past, and he always used to sort of do. So I always. <laughs> I always try to do something jolly and it's very difficult to, to it. I haven't got the courage to do something as outrageous as Dudley Simpson going, bee, bitty, 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 bitty. <laughs> I sort of do it and I go, Oh, I don't know. That's, I, that's a bit weird, <laughs> isn't it? So, um, but I settled on something for intelligence for war that I was really happy with, but yeah, always, uh, it's sometimes, you know, having a young producer, Heather Challens working on it. It's a challenge sometimes to, um, Let's challenge challenge. That could be a new segment in your podcast um, uh, for her to understand uh, the music. Like I did the music for uh, one with uh, Katie um, called Supernature, and I decided to err uh, more towards Malcolm Clark for it. It still gets slightly too melodic for a Malcolm Clark yeah. ripoff. But, um, you know, he did the Sea Devils, um, uh, but uh, I. There were some cues that Heather questioned. She said, why is there a spaceship taking off at the end of that scene? I said, no, it's music. You know, because it was sort of going. I don't know whether Zoom is cutting all that off. I don't know. No, um, yeah. But yeah, and I, I had to say, just trust me. I know it sounds weird, but it's it's just fitting, he said, <laughs> um, for the period. Very good. Right style, isn't it? it is that we have gone on a several tangents. We're in a warrant. It's, it's <laughs> we're going on different ta- tangents all over the place. All right, let's climb up out of the rabbit hole. Do you think, uh, Philip, it's time to have a chat about uh, Light at the End? I would love to do that. All right, let's throw in a trailer right here and we'll be back with Nicholas Briggs in a moment. You know, old girl, sometimes I think you're probably the finest ship ever to have sailed the vortex. <laughs> Oh, my word. So now we know. Now we know for sure. But why are they here, hmm? Why are all the doctors here? Hello, my dear. Doctor. What is it, Lisa? Here. Look. In the doll's house, what? Look through the window. Come on, Ace! Run! Back to the TARDIS! What's happened? Where am I? 
You're in the TARDIS. How do you do? I beg your pardon? Oh, no need to. I'm the Doctor, and this I is... I am Leela. Oh, all of them? They were you? It's past five. 17 of the 23rd of November, 1963. On the 23rd of November, 1963. 59A Barnsfield Crescent, Totten, Hampshire. Crescent, Totten, Hampshire, England. Earth. Stop fiddling about and get on with it. Charlie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll come back for you. You hear me, Charlie? Doctor, no! You appear to be some kind of warning. All this cloak and dagger business? You're clearly up to no good. By all means, please do come out to play, Doctor. I'm waiting for you. Nick, anniversary stories. When you think of televised anniversary stories, what do you think of in terms of Doctor Who firstly? I don't know. <laughs> um, do, you, I, do you have a favourite? I mean, is there an emotional favourite you have in terms of Doctor Who on TV? Well, I mean, obviously the three doctors, although, uh, I mean, here's the thing for whatever reason, and let's not, we, before we started recording, we did a bit of a therapy session for me. Uh, let's not do another one of those, but for, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm not a great celebrator. I, I never really, I don't, I mean, obviously I acknowledge Christmas and, uh, and stuff, but I don't. A lot of people are like, oh, goody, they're sort of, let's celebrate something. Let's have a party. And I'm, I, I have a sort of, I feel, it feels almost like an allergy to that kind of thing. So I'm not, and, and when uh, other people at Big Finish say, oh, we've got the whatever anniversary of this coming up, I, you know, I go, okay, yeah, well, we better do something for that then. I'm such a miserable old curmudgeon. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, once I'm there at a celebration, I usually, I usually enjoy it. I might leave early though. Uh, it's lucky I didn't leave before the end of Light at the End, isn't it? Um, so it's, yeah, there, and the, I think, I think the reason I'm so funny about celebrating is that there's such a hype for celebration, isn't there? That they're almost, that any celebration is almost destined not to live up to your expectation. You know, I remember that as a kid being so insanely excited about Christmas. I mean, like, ill with excitement and then you get there and you think oh it was just another day wasn't it it was just another day I, maybe i did dress up as santa claus and put a funny hat on and stuff but i don't know um so uh, th they're quite difficult for me and difficult to know because to me what do you what do you do to celebrate you know do you just go hooray 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 here are a load of balloons here are all the doctors here you know i resisted that for light at the end uh, for ages, but well, it wasn't light at the end then, it was nothing. David Richardson, you know, kept saying to me, he was the line producer then, he kept saying to me, you know, we should really do something. And Alan Barnes and I were formulating something. And I really can't remember, I honestly can't remember what it was, but it was not, it was going to be what we thought was sort of like quintessential Doctor Who, but it wasn't going to be a greatest hits thing. Um, but then David convinced me, with two things, John Dorney had come up with a vague framework and he said, we're kind of thinking something like this. And I thought, oh, that's quite good. Uh, and also it, Tom Baker said, can't we do a, a celebration where we get all the guys in, he said. I thought, well, if there was one person you expected not to want to do a multi-doctor story, it would be Tom Baker. And the fact that Tom Baker was the one saying, why are we not doing this? Can we do this, please? That we that we decided to do it, and I thought, I thought there's no dodging this. It's it's my job to do it. You know, I'm the creative director. I'm meant to be the person who's at the centre of this in in some form. And I thought, and um, I thought if we are going to do a celebration, then I'll do it my way. <laughs> it's like you know, at our wedding, we had no music because we can't stand dancing. You know, so everyone thought we were a bit miserable, but we had a fantastic time. Yeah. So. This was for the 50th anniversary. So, yeah. so how far before the 50th anniversary did you, the planning have to start? Well, that was all down to David Richardson, but it started pretty early. Yeah. I can't remember how I, it must have been over a year in advance. And David kept make, getting other people involved. 
he kept saying oh well, now we've got so and so and i said well where are they going to fit in he said well you know that scene where uh, uh charlie goes into the tardis and she's and maybe something can happen with the walls of time or something and i went okay you can write that bit <laughs> so david richardson wrote those bits okay so your credit, your, no way, no way. your credit as the writer how much of this did you write then well, all of the rest of it. Okay. <laughs> but like the story and what was going on. That little thing, where, you know, the scene, it was just really yeah. weird, isn't it? Where everyone goes, oh, hello, what are you doing here? I've never heard of you. Oh, I'm strange. And I don't know. It was just a little, um, little skit in the middle of an otherwise robust narrative. So before the five doctors, Robert Holmes complains about the fact that he just be, kept being giving a list of this has to be included, this has to be included. You've managed to. Well, include... yeah, you should have done what I did and say, someone else write those bits. If you're so keen on having those in, someone else do it. I'm not doing that. I've written a, like a proper story here. So how, how did you put your story together? Well, how did you decide which doc? Well, which doctors is obvious, the, the ones being finished had. But which companions, how big a role the companion would have. I mean, one thing I, I love what you do is so it doesn't get overly cluttered. You have amazing scenes with Doctor Companion, and then at an appropriate time, the companion just sort of, oops, they're off. Um, otherwise, the story would have been so cluttered. But when did you yes. decide to do things like that? Because I mean, it, 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 I mean that was a bit of a masterstroke to, to have these lovely scenes and then get rid of them and to keep the doctors. How, do you, how did they all come about? Do, do you remember the processes at all? Uh, well, I, I do. I'm rather proud of myself that I've reached that stage of my career that I can give the kind of answer that I saw uh, people who worked on the TV series of Doctor Who giving at conventions years ago. They say, well, it was a long time ago. So I do feel that it's a long time ago. But I, I know that David Richardson and I discussed it quite a bit. And I was very keen not to have a TARDIS full of people all bumping into each other and and you know you constantly have to go through and thinking oh, what would their attitude be to this situation and by the time you get through everyone having their say the the dramatic momentum of the scene is lost because it's all just about ticking the box of whoever's going to speak next and i think you can do that in a short burst but you can't sustain a whole narrative with that going on so i, I knew i very much wanted the each doctor and one other person with them having an adventure. I know I have that big crossover with the eighth and the fourth doctor and Charlie and uh, Lena, um, but uh, generally they sort of stick within their own bounds and then uh, the doctors come together at, at the end, don't they? And that was, I wanted that to be, I didn't want it to, I wanted to be a story and not crowd control. <laughs> yeah, but you, you managed to give the first, second and third doctors still important roles without a lot of narrative. If you did it today, well, we hadn't done our recasting. That's then, what I was going to say. So, if you did it today, would you have had to given them a, a even more prominent role? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd really love to do a new version, uh, a new, new, new version of a sort of three doctors thing, and use you know because these days I, I mainly when my hands-on work at Big Finish is with the first, second, and third doctors, you know. And none of whom are, you know, are those actors alive anymore. And so we've done those recasts, which people have been, you know, by and large, pretty positive about. I understand the problem it is for some people and possibly would be for me if I was on the outside of it. But I love the way people have sort of bought, bought into them, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of would love to get those guys together as well. I know that, you know, Tim and Stephen, Tim Trelaw plays the third Doctor and Stephen Noonan plays the first Doctor. They they get on very well. They're like chalk and cheese. I mean, Stephen is, um, you know, a mad Doctor Who fan, as mad a Doctor Who fan as me. And I will be seeing him later this week and we will have a fantastic mad Doctor Who evening talking ty my minute detail about everything, probably, you know, Inferno or something. Um but and and Tim is a bit like Doctor Who. Tim sends me WhatsApps and go, I've watched the demons. And I'd say, What do you want a medal? You know, he said, and he goes, Oh, I really like the Silurians. I didn't like Ambassadors of Death, he said. And I said, Well, it's it's a tough watch, that one, but I adore it. And he's like, brings you mad. Um, so you know, Tim does this impersonation of Stephen where he just sort of says, uh, oh yeah, in episode nine of that story, the daughter of the script editor was in fact the husband's wife of the man who, you know, and he he uh, lampoons Stephen's uh, detailed knowledge whilst also 
um, inadvertently making fun of himself because, you know, in order to improvise that, Tim has to reveal that he knows nothing about Doctor Who, except that he has watched The Demons. And he so does that, keep did playing he, Did he clip. get that medal? Yeah, no, no. But maybe one day I'll do that for him. He uh, He's also, he's got it in his head. He wants to write a third Doctor adventure. Okay. That'd be good. And he's got, he's got ideas percolating and there's there's something there. It will require a bit of work. But, okay. Uh, wow. Okay. Heard here first. Brilliant. Right. Um, well, actually, on the on the ca uh, casting of the first Doctor in Light at the End, I found myself just briefly thinking, who, who is this? I couldn't, I, I'd f completely forgotten. It was William Russell, of course. Um, yeah. Who was doing a lot of first Doctor at the time and we haven't heard him for for such a long time it was lovely to have him in in that role yeah um for the 50th so he's been in the 50th he was in the last year's um episode as well and um so yeah that was that was really nice so in terms of being director so he, yeah the writer hands you his script which in this case is you hand yourself a script um it, it wasn't very long time ago how was the process in terms of putting together the cast how do you go about recording such a mammoth work with so many people well, you know, you rely on your producer and David Richardson was the producer and it was a logistical challenge of enormous proportions. And, you know, uh, David just pointed me in the right direction. You know, he, he just sort of said, this is, these are who you're going to be recording with on these uh, this day. Not all of them could be there. So we need someone to read in here and then you'll do this other session with this other person here. So he absolutely, I mean, you know, after I'd written the script, I, I'd, tried to do a schedule to show who we needed him but it, it was really my schedule had to fit around availability really and so it was a real jigsaw puzzle and all in the wrong order and uh yeah all, all over the place it was it was a nightmare that was my least favorite part of it actually doing the directing and being there with the actors and talking about the scenes that was great but the whole the fact that I had to keep sort of you know re-angling my brain in order to work out where I was. I, I find it, you know, much, I've always found it much easier as much as possible to do everything in story order, which you can achieve more easily on audio because you don't have to keep knocking sets down and rebuilding them or whatever, you know, but, you know, we'd have that flexibility to do it in a different order in terms of availability. Yeah. I mean, it's like, um, you know, one of the reasons we probably won't do any more Space 1999 is just getting the cast together. It just became so ridiculous by the last season. I don't think, I think only two people recorded together. And uh, you just think it, 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 it luckily they're all brilliant uh, and it edits together beautifully and you hardly know, but it does uh, slightly suck some of the joy out of it but i think it was quite I mean, it was great to have tom baker and paul mcgann in the studio together it was very strange they really gelled in performance but they hardly spoke otherwise i seem to remember i mean not uh, not in a frosty way they sort of sat in the green room together and it was sort of, oh, all right yeah, yeah you know to me it was very strange and so especially since they're both from liverpool you'd think they would have a lot to discuss but it was a sort of a strange experience just on Space 1999, you should just get Glenn McCready to play everybody. Well, I suppose that would be an option. <laughs> I know there was one instance in the last series where someone's lots, another actor's lines were lost because of the fragmented process. And so we rewrote some scenes and had Glenn McCready's characters say those lines instead and change the sense of it slightly rather than go through the whole process of trying to get the actor back who was far less available. Right. One of the things that stood out to me, I'm very sensitive to, to, to music theme tune. There was a special theme tune done for this episode. Um, I don't know if you had much to do with that, but listening to it this time, it actually, I actually got shivers, chills up up my arm because um, because of the way it was arranged. And I love electric guitar, Philip. You know, I love electric yeah. guitar, and it's got love, that in the I theme. I love flute. It has some lovely flute parts in it. It's got that in there too. It's got everything. It so, very, did you have anything useful. to do with that theme arrangement, Nick? Well, of course, it's Jamie Robertson, and his music really does have the ability. It's sort of a you know to to move you. It slams into you quite often. A, a real emotional. 
uh, uh, thud, um, for want of a better word. Um, Jamie said to me, I'd like to do something that has loads of different Doctor Who era elements in it. And I said, okay, uh, that could just sound like an awful noise, but give it a go. And he said, and he was really keen to do it. He said, how about this? And I said, yes, that's fantastic. I love it. So I don't, I don't, I don't remember giving any notes about it because I have, there, you know, if you spoke to Jamie, uh, he'd probably bring his dog along as well. But if you spoke to Jamie, he would uh, tell you that I have on various product productions um, been very close with my notes, you know, very sort of nitpicky and saying, oh, you need to just get, look this bit here, uh, like with the UFO and um, uh, what else, all the prisoner, you know, I gave it, you know, he did. He went through a lot of pain with me for the prisoner. But once Jamie gets it and clicks into the right mode, he just flies. You don't need to say anything else to him because he goes, oh, that, I get it now. You mean that I, now that makes sense to me. And this theme for Light at the End is an instance where I think he didn't need all that. He he had an idea and we were simpatico on that. I just thought, yeah, I love what you're thinking about. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, I've, I've re-listened to that theme quite often and enjoyed the sheer, well, celebratory nature of it. Yeah, I like the celebration. It is, it is a huge theme, and I stopped to listen to it a lot too, Dwayne. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of this is a huge celebration, all the Doctors, It's it's got a traditional feel in terms of, and it was celebrated as such in terms of bringing together those Doctors, big, big, uh, not big finish, in Doctor Who Monthly, I remember it was having a big spread, some lovely photos of the Doctors all on couches. It was really well received. Is yes. this the last? But is this going to be the last time something like this? Because this, this year you've gone for the once and future concept, a very different concept to celebrate the 60th. Do you think we'll ever see something like this again? Or is this going to be the last hurrah of a multi-Doctor story? Yeah. Well, I never say never. I mean, let's see how. Uh, what what year would the this uh, it would be? Thirty three, the seventieth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I might not be here. Oh, you'll still be here, but you might be. Uh, <laughs> I might have before. retired. <laughs> I don't see you retiring either, but that might be interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not thinking. Or I did have a fantastic idea for a sort of really special anniversary style story that I'm not going to tell you about now. Um, but, uh, and it sort of was multi-doctor, but not in the way you'd expect it to be. I think, you know, what you've got to do it, uh, for an anniversary thing is boil down what exactly you think embodies what you think is important about Doctor Who at that particular moment in history. That's what Russell's done with his specials. Uh, and it's you know, not multi-Doctor stories. It's something that for him just gets to the heart of Doctor Who and restates its purpose for uh, you know a new audience. Um, so there are many, and who knows what the world will be. I mean, you know, in in uh, ten years ago, we couldn't predict what the, the world is very different now to the way it was ten years ago. So much has changed, and goodness me, it will change as much again by the time we get to the seventieth anniversary. So, I don't know. I mean, what do you think the world's going to be like in ten years' time? <laughs> that stumped you, hasn't it? Yeah, it sure has. <laughs> so far, I mean, it's going to be. I'll probably be walking with a stick, I'd imagine. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you always hope that the world will be better in 10 years' time, but we don't seem to be learning any lessons at the moment. It's a bit hard to say. Yeah, I think we were quite optimistic 10 years ago, but it's all it, gone a bit it, weird, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think 10, 20 years ago, we were far more optimistic that you know, we were heading in the right direction. And now there's sort of, yeah, we just just, things are being swept up and... Every issue. Well, there's this really weird thinking goes on. Like I, you probably haven't heard, but in the UK, you know, uh, our government's uh, solution to uh, one of their solutions to homelessness, they've noticed that homeless people use tents when it's yes. um, raining. So their idea to solve homelessness is to Take make it legal for them to have tents, which just you just think you 
that's the kind of thing you put in a science fiction story as an example of a sort of crazy thinking, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, anyway, but that's well. If it's illegal, you could apology. arrest them, lock them up. Then they've got a roof yeah. over their head. Is that what? Is that what they mean? Yeah, yeah. Is that it? Yeah, and then they complain that the prisons are too full, and mm. oh, you know. Well, they try and find them, but they have any money to pay. They just yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all, maybe try and solve the root cause. You know, yeah. well, we've given up yeah. on that. So. Don't do that. Just complain about it and just make people hate them. <laughs> Beggars believe them. What What are you looking most forward to in terms of celebrations in the future? You, you're not a big celebration person. But in terms of this, the 60th and where Big Finish is going, what's 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 the what's exciting you at the moment that you can talk about? Uh, I'm very excited about uh, Fugitive of the Daleks coming out next year, uh, which you know that uh, Vicky is in it with the First Doctor. Yes, um, I'm very excited about the plans we've got for our next Second Doctor box set. Uh, I, Mark Wright and I are writing them uh, because there's so many continuity strands to pick up. It ended the last box set ended on a cliffhanger. It did, and we're getting more uh, first Doctor stories uh, in the bag because I want to, you know, work with some of the other companions as well. You know, we've got uh, Maureen O'Brien, who's uh, who I love and who's brilliant, and lots of other brilliant people hopefully coming in to appear with the first doctor. So th those are my ranges that I have the biggest involvement uh, with. Uh, I've just started doing the music on next year's first third doctor adventure. We haven't revealed the title, <laughs> so I can't tell you about that, but I've started doing the music on it and it's very, it's a Sarah Jane one. Look, like just that, that oh, you good, can have you. an exclusive. Yeah, yeah. The, the, th the, uh, the third doctor, sets are getting better and better like oh. uh, i i can't believe how the, the last two in particular have just blown me away um and, I, I and they're was, very different aren't they we try to make them so different, different. From each other. and i was i was mm. so i was so skeptical about the recasting i must admit and i didn't get the first originally i didn't get the first couple of boxes of tim trillia and then i was mm. you know i was sort of talking to getting the third one and of course went back and bought the first two because he's just great and brings a new dimension but just the storytelling is just getting better and better with each story wow. and yeah the seven episodes and it's got the whole feel right and it just it just brings back so much nostalgia but more than that just really good quality stories so that's what I'm well i'd like to i like to get the two together i mean you know there's no point just being nostalgic but yeah. it not being a well-constructed story you've got it's got to be you know and i and i want to imitate the kind of way they told stories in those days but adding a little twist of um, modern energy in it as well. Yeah, yeah. And and when we're doing the um, the Joe Jones and the Third Doctor ones, we have a bit of license to do something a bit weirder and a bit more modern. There's one of those coming up next year as well, which is uh, uh, which I'm working. Uh, uh, it's been written by not by me, but I'm working on the script at the moment as script editor, and it's really good in it, but it has a real modern sensibility about it. It's a real emotional core to it. Whereas I think the sort of traditional Third Doctor stories, uh, or like like a lot of traditional English entertainment, is people uh, not emoting, people holding back all the time, and then they, the drama comes from the fact that they're not expressing themselves as clearly as the audience wants them to, and that you you get a catch in the throat because of that. You know, I quite like that kind of thing. Uh, you know, like Brief Encounter, where you know that, that movie where it's it's largely about people having feelings but not expressing them and not saying anything about them, and yet you know they're having the feelings. You know, it's funny that it was the Joe Jones set that had me in tears. Was it earlier this year or was it last year? I, the years are going by so quickly, I can't remember. Yeah, do you know, I can't remember off the top of my I, head because I think I'm it was. Of... I think it was earlier this year. Um, yeah, I think it but was. it's certainly. Yeah. It's, well, when, the bit when, when she's talking about Cliff, yes. and you know it's about Stuart too. So yeah, that it, when you know that it makes it much more powerful. And uh, yeah, I was yeah. I was blubbing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've heard the story about how that went, didn't you? Because she, uh, Katie, the gorgeous Katie, who I saw last night, always delightful to see her. She, um, 
she had a long con- I said, you know, I want us to get this right. So Matt Fitton's writing it. Have a conversation with Matt. She said, yes, I'd like that. So she spoke to him and they talked about how they were going to handle the whole Cliff thing. I said, do you want Cliff to be dead because Stuart's dead? Or what do you want to do? Do you want to just say he's not there? Because my initial plan, I have to say, was to have Stuart in it and have Cliff in it, you know. And then then sadly he died, which was, you know, terrible news. Uh, and uh, so anyway, she said, yes, I think he, he should be dead in the storyline as well. And I said, OK, well, talk to Matt about how you think well, we don't want to do anything that, you know, you don't feel you can support. You know, it has to be the way you want it. So they had a great conversation and she was very happy with the result of the conversation. And then the script came in and then she said to me, as she always does on the phone, she said, she said, well, he's got it all wrong. It's not right at all. I said, but this is he's writing what you told him to write. And she said, Oh, well, I said, listen, it's all right, my love. Just, you know, you, she always changes bits here and there. I said, just bring your changes in and, you know, we'll, it'll work. And she said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. It'd be great. It'd be great. And so she came into the studio. I said, so now we come to this last scene. Uh, so what changes have you got for me? Should we go through it? She said, oh, I was just thinking of making it up, she said. <laughs> and I said, okay, and Tim went, okay. She said, so you say your lines and I'll just say other things. So we did two takes where she just said all sorts of things. <laughs> and, and, a, a, and she'd scribbled some stuff on her script, but she was mainly just improvising. And both times she cried uncontrollably. Um, and I think you do need a bit of the brief encounter holding back, because otherwise it's just, if you pardon the phrase, snot. It's just snot. <laughs> you know, it's all that. And it, and it just becomes unpleasant. It's not, you don't have any emotional involvement with it. You're just thinking, has she not got a handkerchief? So I said, uh, and she said, is that all right? And I said, there's so much brilliant stuff in there. I said, leave it to me. I'll sort it out. And she said, okay, darling, I don't think I could do it again. Because she was emotionally exhausted. And so uh, when we gave it to the editor, Luke Pietnik, I think it was, wasn't it? Was it Luke Pietnik, that one? Could have been. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Well, I said to the editor, I said, I'm not going to make you edit that. I said, send me the dialogue stems for that final scene and I will edit that scene for you. Because otherwise I spend ages going, no, not that bit. No, the bit. <laughs> okay, send it me again. No, no, that I, you know, sometimes, luckily, because I am a sound designer, you know, my skill set involves that. I can leap in there and do it. I mean, that's by the by, just to go off on a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, the um, uh, How I work with uh, uh, Toby Hritzek Robinson um, when he does music for us, you know, I say, OK, this music's brilliant. Send me the stems. That's the individual tracks of all the bits. And I said, um, may I just have a little play with it? And he lets me do that. And I often reposition his music and put it extend it and mess around with it and, and stuff. And then bless him, he always says, that's much better, isn't it? And I thought, and I would go, phew. Um, so I like I like to get in there. I, you know, I said, I could give you notes, but it will just bore us both to death. Just let me pull my sleeves up and just get under the bonnet because I know how this should work. And luckily he trusts me. And that's what I did with Katie's final scene in Supernature. Who was it? Did you look it up? Well, the sound design could be by Luke, but unfortunately with the website that just throws everybody in, it's either yeah. David Rowcroft, Benji Clifford, or Luke. Luke, But it probably was Luke. i go with your your guess. It's it's, it's sound designed by three people for each of the different stories. Maybe it wasn't Luke. Maybe it wasn't Luke. Well, anyway, either, I, either I did Dave, cut it I don't think it was Benji. I, I, no. We were just talking... Dwayne and I were talking before, as soon as Audacity started, we went, oh, that's Benji. Because um, <laughs> we we picked Benji immediately because of the, the detail. I don't know how it's time to put so much detail in. Um, so, yeah, my guess would be would be either Luke or David Rucroft. Yeah, Who I think it was David Rucroft. Right. We did well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it can I just say, if it's going to be a whinge about anything, it'd be the website in terms of, yeah, please lay things out. <laughs> <laughs> or give me access so I can fix it. <laughs> well, there is allegedly a new one coming soon. Oh no, well, we're always saying that, aren't we? Even before <laughs> this one, we were saying another one's coming soon. But you know, as creative director, uh, once upon a time, 
I had big involvement with website stuff and could pick up a phone to the person responsible for it and get them to do things. And uh, the bigger Big Finish got, people would say to me things like, you've got too many responsibilities, Nick, and it's driving you insane. You know, there are other people here who can deal with these things. And what's more, we don't want you to talk to the people who run the website. And um, so that's why it's all gone wrong. <laughs> I, I, can't, I, you, I can't even say understand. It. I don't know how you write as much as you write. You direct as much as you direct. You act in so many productions. Um, exit your reading scripts, your, your script writing. How you do all that for Big Finish is beyond me. And yet you're still doing other things for the main show. You're still doing other creative things. Do you actually have a wife? Does she actually see you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't want to see me that much, luckily. Oh, okay. She's, Enough. That's good. Uh, she, yeah, yeah. She, she has never once said to me, why do you keep going away? Why are you not here? Because she's very much an accepting sort of person. You know, she's very happy when I'm there, but she never makes me feel bad about not being there, which is amazing, actually. She is quite remarkable, really. I mean, you know, you could argue that making yourself over busy, as my therapist has said, is is a form of avoidance, avoiding whatever it is about yourself that you don't like. You can't face it. So you just go busy, 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 busy. I think there's some truth in that. But um, yeah, and I think, you know, just to be serious about that whole business about the website, I think that people were right when they said to me, you, you can no longer yeah. have responsibility for this because it's just crushing and you have to be sensible you know i worry about jason haig ellery because he has lots of interests beyond big finish and he he is uh, i'll say it out loud for him to hear on the internet because i say it to him you know he is doing too much it's it's really difficult to concentrate but he just he just feeds in more there are more and more projects keep coming up that he's doing outside of big finish and you just think well it's just you know, you have to try and be sensible. You have to work out what it is that's driving you to do too much. So you don't feel like you're doing too much? Well, um, I feel I've really cut back. You know, in terms of the directing and writing and uh, music, I'm just doing the first three Doctors now and not all of the music by any means. The only reason I did the music on... Um, the incident incident was because someone dropped out at the last minute. I can't remember who it was dropped out, but they did. And, you know, the room you was empty. It. it was just me sitting there. And I said, I bet. And, and of course, I thought, actually, I'm quite thrilled about doing that. But, you know, I I, I, um, I did that. But I, I tried to keep myself out. And it's the third doctor I'll do the music for. Uh, and, you know, and we're recruiting new people all the time, getting new producers and new directors on board, getting younger people on board, trying to find more women, more people of colour, so that it's more representative um, what, what we do. And so, yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping by virtue of pursuing that policy that I won't be quite so bad. It'd be very difficult to get the first, second and third doctor away from me, though. And, you know, and I'm working with a young female producer on that. And... Uh, and that always brings a new perspective to it. You know, Heather's got a real sense for, she goes uh, along with Emma Haig. They, they go through all the storylines for all the other ranges with me. We've worked out that's the best way to do it. We have a sort of reading session where, you know, we're on a Zoom and I've got the file. I, I have to read them. You know, Heather said, you're better at reading out than me. <laughs> you do that. And I read it out, and but you know Heather in particular is pin sharp on um, plot inconsistencies or things that aren't explained properly, you know. And she's going, "Well, how come these people?" And I go, and, uh, there are "A lot of things that I would leave to a, a writer or a script editor to sort out." She's like, "I don't, I don't get why that's happening." And I think, "Well, fair dues, better ask them." And they always do have an explanation, you know, but they send us slightly shortened versions. So you can't expect out everything there. So, uh, yeah. So hopefully, by virtue of getting other people involved, you know, I will. Um, and I'm not leaping to the fore quite so much as I used to, to say, no, 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 that's important. Let me do that. You know, I didn't with Once and Future, 
the Hermione contribution to Once and Future, I was reminded after I said, it's a blooming good title, that, David, David Richardson. He said, yeah, it was your idea. I went, oh, what's it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We told you what the project was and said, what should it be called? They gave me a load of titles. So I don't like any of those. And I came up with Once and Future. So. Yeah, I've just been reminded uh, with with mention of your wife, that um, hmm. <laughs> since we we're talking about the light at the end, you had another family member appear in that story. Yeah, my son Ben. Yeah, that's when he was yeah. young enough to be sort of influenced to say, "Do you want to come and do something for a recording?" And he barely understand what it was. Yeah, and we just went out in uh, my mother's garden, and I said, "Imagine, you know, you're playing football, and you know." And he's so it's a lovely recording actually because he's actually outside. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We always take Mickey out of. Does he have dreams of becoming an actor? No, a... no. He's too. He's too um, shy. Oh, really? He's not. I was very shy at his age as well, and uh, maybe maybe he. I don't know what happened to me. I sort of blossomed when I was sixteen, but he's fourteen now. Uh, so yeah, he's too too shy. Yeah, he doesn't like the idea of getting up and reading aloud, or you know, he's very much his. We've never pressured him into anything, so he's kind of developing his own personality without us saying you should and shouldn't do this. You know, which which mean which means he's one of the loveliest human beings I know. He's amazing. I love him to bits. Well, of course you'd expect me to say that, but I particularly, I particularly do. I think he's fantastic. He's fourteen and he's not an annoying teenager. He's He's still a lovely person who's very genuine and intelligent and asking questions all the time. But yeah, I so I don't I think the last time when was the last time I got him to do something? Uh was it for a sort of ghostly one? Where he was like voices of children in oh no, what was it? It was for the first doctor, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, it, the, the in the um, uh, what was the first one of the first doctors called? I can only remember the last one, the Demon Song of the Interton Incident. It was um, the one set down in the with, with um, Paul Copley. He was Paul Co Copley's son in oh, it. Oh, that's right. Oh, they the, had that the the mm -hmm. something ist the the somethingist. Oh, the miniaturist. Miniaturist. Thank you. Just... Yeah, goodness me. I mean, I'm talking about something 10 years ago. I can't even remember something that was two years ago. Um, yeah, the miniaturist. And we'd experimented with the idea of the sun sounding like um, an older person. And, and um, you know, and we did some pitch bending. It just sounded rubbish. And I just said, I'll just get Ben to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. He did. And he even managed to do a little bit of a northern accent as well. I didn't even ask him to do that. But when he heard the uh, Paul Copley speaking, I think he just sort of naturally, without really Copied thinking it. about it, Im imitated his voice. Yeah. So awesome. And it made it so spooky to have an actual child. Yes. His voice is a little bit deeper now. So I just just got him just in time on that one. <laughs> well, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's um, yeah, a production that we have really enjoyed and I'd love going back to and listening to again. So Thank you for right. writing and directing it and for talking to us about it. Pleasure. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, Audacity. Lady Audacity Montague. And I'm the Doctor. There is a comet crossing the sky tonight. I am away to my telescope. A shooting star that creeps across the sky. It is most curious. Did nobody ever tell you to be careful what you wish for? The Devouring. They're called The Devouring. I shall consume you. Doctor, this starship, does it take you through the darkness? In so many ways. Ladies, gentle beings, we're delighted to welcome you to the Aurum. A golden domain. Quite literally. Our Viceroy of Victory. Oberon Fix! Audacity, we have to leave. Now. They're locking us down! Humanity and their allies are facing the greatest threat to their existence. All Aurum security measures are being deactivated. A near on 
unstoppable enemy that not only courses through the galaxy, but converts it, corrupts it. The Doctor! Grab some glitter guns, glitter bombs, anything you can carry. You're Vogan. The guards are Vogan, but none of the guests at that gathering were. Fated, foretold, this weapon ends the war. The Cybermen never give up. It's a Cybermat. Off the flight deck, both of you. Both of you! You will let us in. Not by the hairs of my chinny chin chin. You were right, Vra. It is the silence that gets you. Big finish for the love of stories. All right. Uh, on that note, it's time for some recommendations. Um, mm. I'd love, Nick, for you to go first. However, I've got a little list here, and it says that it's Philip's turn. Sorry, Philip, your turn. You've got to go that's, first. That's okay. I'm actually going to recommend something I've been listening to um, this week. And because we would do all these specials for the sixth anniversary and other anniversaries, I've not had a lot. Not of, my fault. Uh, yeah, it's all your fault. <laughs> I've had a lot of listening time, but I download and been listening to Audacity, and I'm actually going to recommend Audacity. I love the Eighth Doctor. I'm a huge Eighth Doctor and Charlie fan in particular. I love him to bits, um, and I love Charlie. Uh, but it's really exciting to go back and see a, a different period of the Eighth Doctor because in the Time War he's getting. I don't know if the right way to describe it. He, he's he's becoming hardened by the time war, which is important for the character. And I mean, I'm enjoying what the time war is doing. I've just finished Gallifrey Time, the room too. What's it called? The War Room, um, which once again so bleak, but such so brilliantly written and so brilliantly acted. But Audacity is light-hearted, and it just having just listened to the War Room and gone into Audacity, it was just nice to have fun again. And one of the things I love about Doctor Who is it can be lots of fun and enjoyment and Paul McGann is having such a good time. Um, I do think the new companion, Audacity, is amazing. Jay Griffith is such a great actress. I loved on the TV show. I'm loving her performance now. Um, her voice is just so distinctive and the way she plays off Paul McGann is just so cleverly done. Um, her introduction story and also in the Regency period with, you know, there's a, you know, with um Queen Charlotte at the moment. It's very topical going to the that sort of period of time. So it was really fresh in my mind in terms of what it, what it looked like. Um, so it, I just felt it, and it was just such a clever idea. So Audacity, if you haven't got it yet, it's really worth a listen. So yeah, grab it, download it. It's a brilliant story. I've got a bad feeling for your look on your face, Dwayne, that you were going to recommend it, but I might be wrong. But anyhow, oh no, oh that's how many cool. how many how many episodes of this podcast have we done, Philip? We have never snapped before on a recommendation. Oh until really? Today. There's until too much today. To... Oh, we have snapped. Uh -huh. Yeah, because because I wanted to listen to Audacity straight away. I've been listening to so much stuff. I haven't listened to anything else other than our anniversary themed episodes, and I rebelled and went, "No, I'm listening to something new." Um, so I'm going to also choose Audacity, but. Look, listen to the sound design. I, as soon as that glass, that drink was poured in the opening five seconds, I went, "Yeah, there's Benji Clifford right there." There was <laughs> so much, so much detail. I can, I could see Benji there with his microphone up against the glass, whatever, he, wherever he does that. Um, <laughs> really, really good stuff. And I can say, I do know for a fact, Philip, that you haven't heard right to the end yet. No, I have I heard, heard right to the heard, end. No, I haven't. Heard so the very end, yes, yes, uh, there is something. If, coming if, if, is there yeah there is something that you are going to love i know you're going to love it so listen to the end so okay bed, bed tonight um, before i go to sleep i'll listen to the last episode last bit and the great thing about the eighth doctor audios is that there's another one coming next month so you don't never have enough so I, I should i'm sorry i should have done the, i should have done the war room because i do think the war room is amazing sean carlson i think puts in his best performance ever and he does a grief scene in that um something happens to someone close to him he acts grief in such a powerful way that I was brokenhearted for him and, oh. and Narvin, which it, it was just, you know, Narvin, who I hated when Gallifrey started, um, he's yeah. now become one of my favourites. He's such an ass, isn't he? He, he, well, he was, <laughs> but he, I like him now. And as yeah, I said, yeah. there's, a, there's a real a real tragic scene and what, what they do to two characters in one of the stories is awful. And the pain he feels because of it is just generated so well. Lou is just magnificent as always, but it is bleak, and you have to. Yeah. <laughs> I really wasn't a bad. I was not. I was just in such a down mood at the end of it all. <laughs> I need to go and put something fun on. 
um, <laughs> which was just it was just nice to have a light release. That's you know, that's why Audacity was so good because it's lighted me up again. So that's what you want in a month. Is you want you want to have stories that that affect you in all different ways. I, and, I recently told Sean Carson that he was my favourite Welshman, and then he immediately went and showed the WhatsApp message or text to Tim <laughs> Trelaw, who was at a convention oh. with. So, you know, <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to be nice, and now it's become a contest. I thought all I need now is Russell T. Davis to write to me and say, "Oh, I thought I was your favourite Welshman." You know. Actually, speaking of Sean Carlson's acting, it's not just in the recent stuff too. Remember, we were talking with Conrad Westmass a couple of episodes ago, Philip, and and he was oh, talking about the funny. first day Sean Carlson came into Big Finish and did that scene for Natural History of Fear, yeah. uh, which is actually part of the trailer um, of of that story, and that I. When I listened, re-listened to that, I, I could hear what Conrad was talking about. Uh, such a such a great actor is Sean. Mm. We're hogging the reviews, uh, the recommendations here, Philip. So, what about you, Nick? Have you got anything that you'd like to recommend, or have you just got too much going through your head? Uh, well, no, I'd like to recommend because uh, coming up is a special release from the Eleventh Doctor Chronicles uh, called uh, Broken Hearts. But I'd like to recommend uh, the uh, earlier one um, from. Um, February, which is uh, all of time and space. Yeah, uh, that was the last one I worked on directing. Uh, you know, starring Jake Dudman as the Doctor and Safia Ingar as uh, you know his companion Valerie. Um, and it's just it's such a sort of groundbreaking, different kind of box set. Every story has something really uh strange and weird about it did you hear it yes Absolutely. yeah so you just have yeah i mean that all of all of time and space by ellery quest about a person who seems to be inventing doctor who uh more of a base under siege thing in the second one the yearn yeah. um, that's what i remember um, but but there but there's a weirdness to it that you couldn't predict and the curiosity shot by james goss is just you know, such a huge acting challenge for Jacob Dudman, uh, who does an amazing job of being the eleventh Doctor, thinking he's various other incarnations, sort of channeling various other incarnations. So, they, so he's not just doing a John Pertwee voice; he's doing the eleventh Doctor doing a John Pertwee voice. And we really struggled over this. And one of the really interesting things I found was that every time on those particular difficult i can't remember which ones uh but the particularly difficult combinations jake would stop himself thinking he'd messed it up at exactly the point he got it right, right. because something weird happened in his mouth and head and he'd think oh what was that and i'd say that was it that was it go back do it like that again he said you sure because i you know I thought, because something crazy happened there and it's amazing and it is uh, you know you never get anything expected from James Goss. You know, he has such an incredible imagination and can always be relied upon to deliver something uh, that it's always special, you know, mm. in so many different ways. And what he's doing with Torchwood as well, you know. Amazing. I was never a great viewer of Torchwood, but what he's doing with the audio range, I think, is incredible. So imaginative and so varied. It's brilliant. I mean, I think James led the way with Torch with, with his own writing. So he, did, he must have done five or six in a row, each of which was extraordinary and different. And just yeah. seeing the new writers now take up where he modelled, um, we are having some amazing, amazing Torch In fact, in terms of monthly range, Torch I think, is becoming the most creative and interesting range we have at the moment. So I think, I think yeah. it used to be Companion Chronicles. I used to adore Companion Chronicles and the way it was so inventive and kept changing. Um, but at the moment, Torchwood is just doing this amazingly creative thing every month. You're never quite sure what tone you're, you're going to get. You're not sure what's going to happen in terms of even, even you know, a single cast member, big cast, um, where it's going to be set. It's just exploring so many different facets. It's been a great range. Well, you see, and the other brilliant thing about James, he produces the range. And, you know, uh, some of our ranges, we have, for various reasons, struggles getting it out on time or whatever. There are various logistical problems. James has really got it nailed down with the organisation of it as well. You know, so he's a joy, really. He's in his own little universe creating all this amazing stuff. And it never creates a problem. 
you know, and if there is a little problem, he'll just inform us, but he's already got a solution, which is the best kind of problem to hear about, isn't it? <laughs> One where it's, the problem's already solved. Great. Very good. But that's my recommendation, yeah, all of uh, time and space. Yeah. And that whole, box, that whole box season of 11th Doctor Chronicles is coming to an end soon, so it's yeah, worth jumping on and getting to the whole yes, season, I think. definitely, definitely. And Jacob's performance as Matt Smith is, you know, it's kind of more Matt Smith than Matt Smith. Yeah. So it's only once it's, in the future. I, I, in, the, in, in the final once in the future, I was just listening to, you know, to finish off the series. When Matt, when the, you know, the, the 11th Doctor came on, I actually had to check and think, oh, hang on, is this Jake or is it actually Matt? Have you managed to pull in Matt? Because it's, yeah, he's such a great performance. Yeah. I mean, I really do think that if we released those and said Matt Smith was in them, people would just believe it. Yeah. I think you're right. I've tried it with my wife and son who have no connection to all this. And I played it and say, who do you think that is? They go, well, it's Matt Smith. And they go, no, nope. I go, really? It's not Matt Smith. Yeah. Yeah. You just Amazing. can't believe it. I think that, you know, if we ever do get Matt in the future, and who knows if that'll ever happen, you know, I think Matt will have Matt's voice will have changed because he's so much older now. And I think that people will go, is that actually Matt Smith? You know, <laughs> they might not think it's him. <laughs> That's it. We'd have to get Jacob to dub his lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should uh, leave the recommendations there and that kind of wraps it up for this episode of the sirens of audio it only leaves us to say thank you so much for joining us nicholas briggs thank you pleasure to be here so much and philip you know i love your company too thank you so much for being here yeah i'm happy to be here too and to celebrate the doctor who's 60th anniversary what could be more fun we're not we're celebrating I'm no celebrating. we don't do celebrating <laughs> uh, nick does do celebrations i still do celebrations yeah. What, I'm better way to spend it. what better way to spend the 60th anniversary well that was two days ago this is the 60th anniversary episode on tv today all right thanks yeah. again guys appreciate it we'll catch you all next time bye everyone this has been the sirens of audio episode 180 the light at the end with our guest nicholas briggs and your hosts philip edney and Dwayne bunny original theme music composed by joe kramer more about us from sirensofaudio.com Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials at Audio Sirens. Happy Doctor Who anniversary audio files. We'll hear you next time.